Good morning and welcome to Friday's OTB AM. It is a packed show as always for you on a Friday and as always I'm delighted to say uh, we're joined in the studio by Off The Balls primary OTB AM presenter Owen Shane. Primary, yes, uh, and you know you, you elevate from primary to post-primary to secondary and then on to university and I'm That's delighted true. to be joined in the studio by our university presenter Adrian Barry this morning. I'm glad that you've sought to seek the negative in what I was saying there Owen. Obviously I was um, insinuating your importance to OTB AM. Um, but I mean, you've managed to skew that in a very Irish way that you've sort of spun the negative on it. Well, you know, it's a great day to be Irish, of course, this morning, so I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to get into the, the psyche of the Irish person because, yeah. you know, we're all proud to be Irish today. The hockey's great. Uh, you're the anti Ronan Agara, by the way. We might talk about that a little bit later on. He's yes. sort of. He's a glass half full man, a little bit more than half full actually as it turns out as he's been speaking about this morning. But yeah, we're all about the hockey on. It's um, an unbelievable story really. I have to admit, I didn't get to see too much of the game yesterday. I was in here and I was trying to get out of here um, and I caught some of the penalties but it was like it's an exceptional story. It's one of the in a summer that keeps on giving. It's one of the stories of the summer, isn't it? It's pretty incredible stuff. It is. It is remarkable and like, let, let's call a spade a spade here. We're all very, very happy this morning for having got one over India. Like, there was a, a sense of surely lightning can't strike twice and we can't beat mm. uh, a superpower once again of the hockey world. Of course, a nation with whatever, one and a half billion times. I did the maths this morning, actually. Well, man, yeah. They've got 277 times the population of Ireland. Oh. So, you know, that, that is something. You, you think of all the great Indians in the past. You think of the likes of Gandhi. You think of the great architectural wonders like the Taj Mahal. And then you remember, with a result like that last night, we have the Cliffs of Moher and we have Michael D. Higgins and we have great things ourselves, including a great hockey team and it was a fantastic penalty shootout last night. Aisha McFerrin, one of the best goalkeeping performances we've seen in any sport mm. all year and it's very fitting in fact that we're playing Spain next. I hope that goes to a penalty shootout, you know, mm. revenge for guys come in 2002 is all I'm thinking. A band to do commentary on it, yeah. And I'm hereby, I think it's, it's especially fitting that we're playing Spain because I'm hereby deeming David De Gea to be football's version of Aisha, Aisha McFerrin. Right. Uh, like, that is the gauge that every other goalkeeper should be going for right now because it was a masterful performance from her class. last night. It, was, uh, it gave us a platform to, to, to finish the thing off and yeah. it, was, it was superb. It was like, in reality, we're all kind of getting reacquainted to a sport that we dip in and out of at different intervals at different parts of our lives whenever Ireland are going well. Mm. And do you know what I'm really happy with is that there is no such thing as any hockey snobbery going on. All the genuine hockey fans on Twitter and all that are like, it's great to have all these people on the bandwagon, yeah, which, is, yeah, uh, which is the way it all should be. Yeah, so it's interesting to see how they uh, sort of harness the success of the hockey team over the next while. And the, I admired the fact that you sort of initially in your comment there sort of you were pretending that you would sort of pluck these figures from the sky, but then you just thought, actually, no, I'll just... No, I did it on my calculator on my computer. It's probably still out of my computer. It's the national sport of India, obviously, hockey. Is it? Yeah. Not cricket. I read yesterday it was the national sport of hockey. I was as surprised as you are now. Right. Okay. Um, but having said all of that, it, uh, the women's game is absolutely non-existent. So well, it's the national sport. In the world. But the women's game, they pay absolutely no heed to whatsoever. Um, and yeah. that probably tells you a little bit about um, society there. But yeah, yeah. which just like just one last thing before we move on. Just looking at Spain and their results in big tournaments in the past. Like obviously, it will be another shock for Ireland to beat them. It wouldn't be a huge shock. Like this is their joint best finish at a World Cup already. Their best finish to date was fourth place in 2006. Other than that, it's been usually 10th, 11th, 6th, 5th Spain. previously. Spain, this yeah. is. Uh, but then you get into the Summer Olympics and it's a similar story. Fourth in 2000, 10th uh, in 2004. And their best ever achievement in any Summer Games or any World Cup happened to be the games that they hosted in 1992 mm. when they won the thing. So I don't know about you, but I, I, like the first thing I'm doing after this show is getting on YouTube to see some of the refereeing decisions in 1992. It's such a happy coincidence that they managed to to win the Olympics on the, in that well, occasion. Look, I won't do that, but if you're going to do it, like you can just let me know if there was. I'm creating a siege mentality here, Adrian. Yeah. All I'm saying is them. that I'm fully sure that uh, the refereeing gods smiled well on, on uh, Spain on that oh, summer occasion yeah. in 1992 and <laughs> karma dictates that they might smile brightly on us on Saturday afternoon. We shall see. We shall, I mean, it is our home, home tournament after all with England now out, so uh, that's the way these things work. Um, right, uh, hockey, it turns out. It's amazing. Here's how it went down at last night's show. Chloe Watkins go. Go with on, a chance. Chloe, oh. Chloe Watkins. Chloe Watkins has done it. Ireland are through to the semi finals of the them. Hockey World Cup. Oh, look at the celebrations. This fantastic yeah. stuff over in England. 
Graeme Shaw and his coaching team celebrate together. All the players run to celebrate as well. Chloe Watkins, the hero. Ireland win the penalty shootout 3-1 and they are heading to the semi-finals of the World Cup where they will take on Spain at the weekend. We are going to have reaction from the Ireland camp before the end of the show. I mean, it's just like Jeff and Cammy really own when you think about it. The two lads, sort of three lads going at it there. Yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, well, you, you can do your coming up and then I can Let's do the coming up. Right, busy show for you today between now and nine o'clock or thereabouts. We're going to be discussing Irish hockey very shortly. We're going to hear some of uh, the coaching ticket around last night's show and we're going to be joined by the assistant coach. Uh, that is coming your way very shortly. We're also going to, I'm delighted to say, be joined by the former Ireland goalkeeper, Nicky Simmons. So that's all coming your way uh, very shortly right here on OTB AM. We're going to be uh, delving into the back pages to let you know exactly what's happening there. We're going to uh, be joined on the line to chat to Lee Keegan. We're going to check in with what exactly the hell he's been doing with himself now that he's had a bit of time to sort of kick back over the last few weeks and obviously preview a pretty bloody big weekend uh, of Super 8's football to decide exactly who's going into the All-Ireland semi-finals and exactly who they're going to be meeting uh, when they get that far. We're going to uh, also play a very special feature that uh, our own Andy Lee has been out and about chatting to uh, retired boxer Seamus McDonough who's had an unbelievably interesting career, an unbelievably interesting life, so that's coming your way. Uh, uh, before 9 o'clock this morning and uh, we're also going to uh, be joined on the line as we have been all week by Johnny Ward who's at Ballybrit for the Galway races so he's going to mark a card uh, for the day ahead and reflect as well a little bit on yesterday's action so that's all coming your way I think we're going to do the uh, back pages now I want to give everybody a bit of a flavour of what's happening there it's a pretty uh, mixed bag OTB AM Thanks to Screwfix.ie Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre uh, it's all gone swimmingly this morning. <laughs> it's seven minutes before eight o'clock on this Friday morning and we're delighted to have you along with us. Get your comments coming into us uh, and we'll bring those to air for you. Right, what's happening in the back pages this morning? We're going to start with the Irish Independent right here and it's hockey all the way. And it's uh, both goalkeepers pictured here. Golden Girls, uh, Isha McFern on the right there with number 19 and the subkeeper Grace O'Flanagan after that uh, quarterfinal win yesterday at the Hockey World Cup. And the first choice goalkeeper wears 19 and the reserve goalkeeper wears 1. Yeah, what's that about? I'm not sure. Uh, we might establish that later on. I mean, maybe it's the dumbest question of all time when it comes to hockey, but uh, it was something that jumped out at me. But she's quite young, obviously, McFerrin, so yeah. maybe she just kind of uh, skipped ahead at the start of this tournament. Possibly, yeah. Ryan exit points tip in different direction, writes Colin Keyes here, Michael Ryan stepping down as the, uh, with some surprise, of course, as the Tipperary hurling manager. And uh, Rory O'Connor. Uh, with an interesting story here. Limerick used rugby hero Earls as a secret weapon for All-Ireland bids. So, in a way that Brezzi had been in chatting to Michael Ryan's, former Michael Ryan, former Tipperary, still Michael Ryan, mm. former Tipperary hurley manager Michael Ryan's team, um, they've been using Keith Earls to go in and give them a bit of a pep talk. Seems like a pretty um, obvious, wise thing to do. Yeah, Conor Murray, the man spilling the beans in that at uh, uh, Munster Adidas launch yesterday. Uh, absolutely wise decision, although Conor Murray does... Uh, does point out that uh, perhaps Irish rugby players aren't uh, the best pe place people to you know talk about getting to semi-finals or succeeding in semi-finals and stuff like that. Obviously, very much tongue in cheek on that occasion. Like Keith Earls is a great shout. Like it's such an obvious thing right there in front of you that uh, for John Kiley to actually bring in some sort of expertise of play in high pressure pressure situations that you know you, you think of the last two England games and the, the end of the Six Nations over the past, past couple of years. Big occasions in Thomond Park. Keith Earls really in terms of putting in clutch performances is a man you want around and mm. it's a fantastic acquisition just to bring him in for a couple of chats I presume that's what it's been yeah. and he's gone uh, off uh, about his own business again but uh, yeah great shout by Kylie I think even more than that he's a guy who over the last couple of years as he's had the conversations in here with us about it about how he has mature uh, reflection now in his career that he's a guy who even over the last couple of seasons has sort of understood the idea of taking control of his own career and up in um, necessarily a sort of um, bystander yeah. when it comes to his own career, like taking control and taking charge. And like that's a fantastic thing that, I mean, even at the stage of his career, he says himself that it was possibly something he should have done a bit earlier. Um, yeah. So hopefully that will resonate with that Limerick team. There is a thing of the Irish uh, rugby, the national rugby team, being one of the most beloved 
teams in Ireland, but also in the spotlight constantly. They are celebrities, the Irish rugby mm -hmm. players. Everybody knows them. So dealing with that from a Limerick perspective is a very new challenge because they haven't been in All-Ireland for 11 years. John Kiley obviously, I don't want to use the word media ban, but has clamped down on media dealings. And I guess dealing with that kind spotlight band, but, yeah. is very much at the forefront of Kiley's mind. And bringing in a national rugby player, a star of Limerick, is a very good move. The Irish Examiner this morning, meanwhile, it's again, as you might expect, it's hockey all the way here. Uh, embracing success, Ireland gear up for World Cup semi-final after a shootout drama. It's a good photograph that captures uh, the mood after yesterday's win over India. Ronan Agar is back, uh, eight months in Christchurch, has changed me as a person, he says. Um, he should have a bit of a pep talk. We, he needs to be the Keith Earls to the Limit Curlers for you, I think, Owen, um, in the way that he's writing this morning about the new positive Ronan Agar and how he reflects on Ireland as a nation. That's the way we are. A glass half empty race of warriors. Yeah, yeah, we I think I he's we are. Well, there's something in that. I, I, I'm certainly glass half full this morning. I mean, I've literally said Michael D. Higgins is better than Mahatma Gandhi this morning, so I think I'm a glass <laughs> half full person. Yeah. Uh, to Brary Hunt, new coaching ticket as Ryan steps down. Reflections as well on uh, Dundalk's exit um, from the Europa League after their heavy defeat to Larnaca yesterday. That's the Irish Examiner. And the Irish Times, meanwhile, Aaron Will leads Ireland to unprecedented heights. Uh, is the reflections here in the Irish Times this morning. Again, more scenes of joy. A lot of them have gone with different photographs. This is one surprising thing. There hasn't been one sort of standout snap that's dominated. Uh, the back pages this morning. Uh, Shaw hails McFerrin for goalkeeping heroics. So we're going to catch up with the Ireland assistant coach a little bit later on. Uh, Lambert win a huge moment in the history of Irish hockey, writes Johnny Watterson there, who's been writing about the hockey all this week. And uh, Murray says that Carberry's arrival will be key for Munster in one of the most obvious statements of uh, the year so far. The rugby season hasn't even begun, and I'm going to put that in as obvious headline of the season. Maybe uh, Joey Carberry ends up being fourth choice out half for Munster. I mean, just... Uh Maybe that was the plan all along. You think? Maybe that's the, the chat they were having with uh, News of Four. Is like, you know what, we really need a, a fourth choice. We need someone to, to give JJ Hanron and Ian Keatley a, a kick up the behind. And uh, News of Four is like, well, there's this guy at, uh, at Leinster. You may or may not have heard of. He can sit in your bench all season. Uh, Times Ireland edition, actually in the front page here, uh, to be fair to them, lead with the hockey story there. Uh, and obviously on the back as well. And Carberry can take Munster to next level is the other big headline there. Um, obviously in full agreement, uh, Kieran O'Reilly there with Owen's point about Joy Carberry's position as fourth choice once throughout <laughs> half. And the racing post this morning, let's be frank, everybody's getting very excited about the new Derby County manager because the odds have been slashed from 18 to 1 to 14 to 1, uh, down to 9 to 2. Uh, for what? To, promotion. For promotion from the championship, so. Interesting. Um, that's what we see. He cuts a dashing figure as a, as a manager. He doesn't look very manager-like actually just yet, but... He, he looks more the physio, doesn't he? he? He looks like he's about to run on, uh, kind of treat a player on the pitch and risk the wrath of Jose Mourinho. That's Maybe what that's his style. Maybe he's more of a Brian Clough type character. We'll see. We, we will certainly see. Uh, the back page of the Irish Daily Mail this morning is Ireland's roar of pride. That's the hockey story. And tip in turmoil, says Philip Lanigan. Premier's summer of woe goes on as management quit. The back page of the Sunday this morning is William Fury. This is uh, star calls and lawyers over transfer letter forgery. This is an interesting story this morning. A furious William is to sue over a forged letter authorising his transfer from Chelsea. So uh, a letter is after doing the rounds where one agent says to another agent that uh, I have claimed the rights of William. He is my uh, now my um, client and my property, mm. and Willian has signed it, but it's not Willian's signature, it's a forged signature, and uh, Willian took a screenshot, put it on Instagram, and was like, this is a disgrace, so I'm going to sue whoever did this, uh, as you were pointing out before we came on air. Why would he do this? Why would he draw attention to this? Doesn't well, make any sense whatsoever. Like the transfer deadline is next week, Adrian, that's yeah, why. exactly. Back page of the Sun is Jolly Hockey Tricks, that is, I, I did already say that was a song, but that is their hockey lead. Headline uh, of the day on the hockey, I'd, I would say. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's a good one. As you say, no repetitive pictures at all, actually, which is interesting. Back page of the mirror is a football exclusive paid in Chelsea. That's uh, Zaha, who is determined to quit Palace for a big money move to Stamford Bridge. Uh, is that not your tab of the morning, no? Paid in Chelsea? Yeah, it's, it, it would be, only that I couldn't care less about the story. Right, okay, fair enough. Uh, it's pretty harsh. Uh, Wilfred Zaha, get in touch. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily... Big Daily's Made in Chelsea fan, on it, sorry. Well, I would have thought you were, but... Uh, we 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 I, 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 no, I have to say, I watch as much of that as I do of Love Island, so, you know. Bit of both. A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. None of either column. L flicking from 3E to, to whatever, ITV4, whatever it may be. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Well, you know, there's, there's title... You love, you love Island Man? 
I would have been if there was no World Cup, I, I suspect. It's a question of I, suspect, really, I right? suspect that would have been a flaw in my character that oh. would have been exposed this summer. But uh, fortunately, the World Cup covered it up, but I wouldn't. I didn't do a Dave McIntyre going that. Go on. Like, oh, yeah, Dave went back so and, and watched it like uh, a series of 24. Anybody who sort of ditches out going to Kerry Games to go to some itty bitty concert is probably going to be a Love Island fan, to be That's fair. That's the most offensive thing I've ever been uh, levelled with. The back page of the Irish Daily Star is Court in a Trap. Chelsea refused to budge. That is a Thibaut Courtois transfer scenario and Ireland go semi-sonic that's a, that's a good headline uh, as Ireland beat India 3-1 on penalties then just to round up things um, the UK titles kind of include this little story here double Dutch England beaten by impressive Netherlands in the World Cup what's that I hear that Ireland have gone further than England in the World Cup is hockey coming home I think I've heard it correctly and it's up here as well the, the cricket gets prominence but don't worry about that cricket look at the top right there England's dream is over. Holders Holland send the host crashing out. That's right, Holland into the semi-final. England not into the semi-final. Guess who is in the semi-final that England aren't? Ireland. That's who. Don't worry about that cricket story there, says Owen, having obviously not read it, so to bring you any, uh, any detail on it. But well, it was Coley, it's... Captain Colossus for England. Fair, fair, fair point. Uh, one other paper to bring you just before we wrap up on the newspapers. It's the Irish News this morning. Performance is Donegal's sole focus, so obviously uh, looking ahead to the big game at the weekend and uh, reflections on Tyrone there as well. And clearly the hockey, which uh, dominates... Everything this morning, and it is uh, to the hockey. We're going to uh, go. We're going to be going to London uh, in camp in just a few minutes' time. But to uh, take us there, I want to bring you uh, some of last night's show. We were joined on the line by the Irish captain, Katie Mullen, and coach Graham Shaw. Talking to Nathan. I'm just so proud of the girls, and I think when the final whistle went, I looked around, and so many faces were were smiling, and I knew that we were going to win that shootout with Aisha McFerrin and goals. She's incredible and, and she's very hard to score against so we stayed very calm we've had we've had those penalties before and we've kind of got a process that we stick to to try and keep things as calm as possible so the girls just, just took themselves aside and, and got themselves calm and composed and feeling positive and then you know Aisha likes her space as well so she executes and uh, we give ourselves the best chance. Can you in any way describe the feeling when the final penalty went in, when Chloe scored and Aisha's making the saves? Can Is there any way to describe with your long career with Ireland what it meant to you? It's definitely a career high. and hmm. I, I just was so proud of the girls. We Every game we play is, is such a team effort. There's no one that puts more on the pitch than the person beside them and it's just, it's a real team effort and yeah, I just felt, I think we all felt on top of the world. Um, just just so proud of the girls. It's just to win in the shootout is bury these demons from 2015 and not qualifying for Rio. So I'm absolutely over the moon. Couldn't be prouder of them. Had you spoken much about that, about the possibility, as is so often the case, that these games can go to penalties and making sure that they're not affected by what had happened in the past? Is that something you thought about ahead of the penalties? Uh, we didn't really bring up 2015, but we've been training them a lot. And what we tend to do is when we play a game against uh, in a, in a, in a t- test series, we tend to do them after the game regardless uh, against the opposition just to get that practice. But listen, it's very, very hard to replicate hmm. pressure, and that pressure is just extreme. So um, I thought they por- performed brilliantly. I knew if we scored two, we'd win because uh, Aisha and goal is just, is incredible at them, and uh, yeah, I knew once the second one went in, it's gonna it's gonna take something special to beat us then. Yeah, what a story, Aisha McFerrin, twenty two years of age and a hero at a World Cup. Yeah, and listen, we've known about her since she was eighteen years of age. I've been watching her since she was eighteen. She is top drawer, and um, it's just so pleasing to see her do it on the world stage because sometimes yeah, we you know when the pressure comes on, it's it can be difficult and as a goalkeeper you can be really really you know not have much to do all the time and then all of a sudden you need a moment and um, she's been superb absolutely superb since the first game and I'm, I'm so happy for her that she was uh, able to show her what she's about and, and win the shootout yeah, if I pass dead on this Friday morning, and it really has been the uh, story of the summer in terms of international Irish sport, Graeme Shaw on the show last night. I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line now by the Ireland assistant coach, Arlene Boyles. Good morning to you, Arlene. Thanks for taking the call. Good 
Good morning, how are you? All is good. Um, I sort of did wonder to begin with when you've just won the biggest game in the sports history and you've the next biggest game in the sports history upcoming uh, tomorrow. How you celebrate that win last night? Uh, quietly, would you believe? Um, <laughs> no, we uh, the girls ha have a very quick turnaround now, so recovery is key. So um, they came home, went through the routine as normal, went through the physio routine. And uh, we aim to try and get them in bed by a decent hour um, and turn their phones off. Is probably the biggest uh, challenge we had last night. But uh, no, they were they were buzzing by the time they came back to the hotel. So uh, I think the biggest thing is sleep for them now, and and we'll go and do recovery today. It must be. It strikes me. It must be a battle to do even just that. That obviously there must be an appetite there for players to jump on Twitter and jump on their phones and text their mates and sort of try and soak up uh, what's what's been achieved almost oh yeah i think the management are worse um but uh yeah i mean it is i mean we we, we talked a lot about uh social media and, and what the impact could be if if we got far in this tournament and and they've been very diligent with it and they've been very good with it um i think it's very difficult not to give them you know their, their moment of sunshine uh, last night and uh, they, they know exactly what they want from this World Cup and I think that's been proven over the last few weeks. Before we look ahead, I know Graham Shaw mentioned the performance of Aisha McFern there last night but the like the coolness and the calmness for such a young player um, last night, was this something that you guys had sort of expected or does it come as a surprise to you? No, it doesn't come to a surprise to us to be honest with you. Um, she, she's as Graham said last night, it's it's just getting these girls on a world stage to show exactly what they can do. And Aisha McFerrin is one of them. She she's proved that she can, you know, control a corner. She's proved that she can control a defence. She's proved that she can take uh, shots in open play. And we all know what she's capable of in, in run-ins because our girls have to practice against that. So that's, you know, it's a, it's advantageous for us because uh, she's incredibly difficult to beat. But uh, no, she she's in a, she's in another place at the minute, and and she's enjoying every moment of it. How much uh, video work would Aisha have done into uh, the Indian takers yesterday? Because it seemed like she had her plan, and she very much stuck to it. And as Adrian said, it was very cool and calculated her goalkeeping. Yeah, I, they, they do a lot of video work. We all do a lot of video work. The, both both goalkeepers, um, Aisha as well. Um, ha had everything, you know, she had she had watched India, she had watched so much uh, sort of corner stuff, she's watched run-ins, and yeah, I mean, it, it's all it's all come true, true for her. She's she's well coached by Nigel Henderson, who obviously looks after Davy Howard as well in Ireland, and uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he's a little bit understated uh, for me, um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's really reaping the rewards now with Aisha and Davy. Why does she wear um, 19, Arlene? Uh, it's a number that she was given um, a while ago, and I think it's now probably a bit of a superstition for her. And uh, yeah, she she doesn't change the number. That, that's her number, and I, I think she'll keep it from now on. All right, yeah, because we wondered about that, whether it was a pecking order thing pre-tournament, but it's almost a bit of superstition. Yeah, it is. It was, it was a number that was just simply available to her when she in, came into the squad. And now, uh, good luck trying to, get, trying to get it off her. <laughs> when you met up pre-tournament, Arlene, what were the, if you can reveal them, what were the expectations or what were the tar targets that you guys had set out before you uh, went to London? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the targets we talked about, goal setting was talked about most tournaments and probably like every team. Um, the big one was to get out of the get out of the group, to get into the crossovers, and uh, and then just see what what could happen. And and we did that, and we did that in spades, my goodness. Mm. Um, and uh, to get straight into the quarterfinals was was just stuff of dreams. Now, we just we just seem to keep going. It's, it's, it's incredible to be part of. Um, but yeah, we're, we now have a semi-final against Spain tomorrow, and who knows what will happen. We might just drop out that line, Arlene, and try and redial you in if we can. Just it's um, just dropping off there a small bit. Um, we'll try and re-establish uh, re that uh, connection to London for um, what's an unbelievable story, really, when you think about it. Yeah, um, very interesting what you were saying there about uh, Nigel Henderson working with Aisha McFerrin and how he also works with Davy Hart, because it did strike me yesterday watching that. It's like, we have two world-class goalkeepers in both genders here. Mm -hmm. That can't be a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And it is very interesting that the one coach 
worked with both goalkeepers. I'd be interested to hear, uh, like, I'm sure we'll, we'll speak to Aisha after the tournament's over, but uh, about that process of creating a world-class person in a position uh, in both teams. It's not, obviously, McFerrin is, a, is clearly a top, top talent, but mm. it's clearly come as a wider culture. Yeah, we well, should look at where you go. Well, uh, it's it's good to have you back. I, I was just uh, what what you said there about uh, Nigel Henderson was was very interesting. I, I just wanted to come back to that for just a moment because, it, like I was just saying to Adrian there a moment ago, I'm not sure if you heard it that it was very striking yesterday watching Aisha McFerrin and just thinking about Davy as well and two world class players and McFerrin will become a household name in Irish sport, not just Irish hockey. You now, just like Davy Hart is. Is that a coincidence that we have two world-class goalkeepers or is that uh, does a lot of credit have to go to Henderson for that? I think a lot of credit has to go to Henderson. I mean, Knight has been around now. He was, he was a goalkeeper himself for Ireland. And uh, he, he knows, he, he's so diligent in, in, in organising goalkeepers and defence for that matter, uh, goal, uh, penalty corner defence. And yeah, he, he deserves... He's, he uh, it's on social media, so he probably is a little bit ignorant to what hmm. is being said at the minute and um, how he's being talked about. But yeah, he deserves all the plaudits um, that, that come his way. Arlene, we're going to be following uh, Ireland's progress with great interest and um, no doubt we'll speak with yourself and the rest of the coaches and the players as well uh, pre-final, uh, hopefully as it, as it uh, pans hopefully. out. But for the minute, thanks William for taking the call. Best of luck tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for me. Arlene Boyles there, who's the Ireland assistant coach. Yeah, we've just had a tweet in from uh, David Brady um, to say, uh, Jerk Gilroy has just been on to me, and I'm delighted to be announced as Off the Ball's new hockey correspondent, London Here I Come, and the double hockey emoji. Uh, so congratulations, David, on the new appointment. I'm yeah. delighted for you. It's prestigious, needless to say. If we travel with DB, we'll have two outings, one to London for the World Cup uh, semi-final and hopefully final, and then to New York next year. Um, we're going to talk to Nicky Simmons, who actually does know a few things about uh, hockey. Uh, sorry, DB. Um, we're going to talk to Nicky Simmons before the show is out as well. Like, it'll just be interesting to talk to her about all of those sort of dynamics, slightly different conversation, and also about how Irish hockey begins to harness some of this stuff, because like we spoke a little bit about it this time last week when the story had started to bubble up a bit. Um, just that entire idea of it's probably caught everybody a little bit by surprise. Arlene talks about the targets that were set beforehand to get to the crossovers. They bypassed the crossovers and straight into the quarters. But nobody really expected Ireland to get this far. And on that basis, how do you put some sort of a plan in place because you're on the back foot straight away uh, to try and harness some of this popularity and actually grow the sport over, sport over the next 20 years? Well, that's the thing. Like, you would be tempted, and I would always be of the opinion that when you have an achievement this great, which is getting to a World Cup semi-final from the position of being ranked 16th in the world, mm. you should celebrate that. You should enjoy every moment until you look around and you see your semi-final opponent and you realise that it's Spain mm. and that this isn't the Netherlands, even, this isn't even England, this isn't even India, mm. this is Spain, this is a very beatable team. They are, they will be considered more of so a... So not, not ideal is what you're saying, we're better off where there's somebody there who we shouldn't beat and <laughs> got the Irish attitude. Well, of. that's the thing, there was such an Irish attitude before yesterday, I would have thought. I, I was certainly thinking, God, we've, we've taken down one big dog already. The worst thing you want to do is try and take down a big dog twice. Yeah. And there was a natural scepticism on my part, I'll admit, that we might not be able to beat India a second time. Mm. And they've proved us all wrong. I'm sure I wasn't the only person thinking that. But Spain, judging by the ranking, judging by their previous finishes, aren't anything better than India or anything Maybe better than... Spain Spain certainly morning. not better than... Anybody who watches from the start this why, morning... Why wouldn't I be down in Spain? Spain. We've, we're, we're going to war with Spain this weekend. <laughs> it, is, it is going to be all guns out for Spain on Saturday. Yeah, well, here we go. I, I, um, I, might, there might be something that suits us to play that India team particularly. They were the team that we beat that qualified us for the World Cup as well. And So there might be something in that. Now, like we've obviously had other results in this World Cup and there's momentum behind us. And you say Spain are a bang average team, as you point out. Um, so. they, they came 12th in, in the last World Cup. And uh, they weren't... Oh, sorry, they didn't even qualify for the last World Cup. They came 12th in 2010. In 2008 in the Olympics, and they came 7th in the 2016 Olympics, they came 8th. No great shakes, Adrian, a is rabble. all I'm saying. They're a rabble. No great shakes. A rabble, uh, the, They're in, a disaster in, of a team. In the vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> they're a cod. An absolute cod, that, uh, that Spain team. Right, quarter past eight on this uh, Friday morning. We're going to talk football with Lee Keegan in just a moment. But first of all, one of the big hurling stories of the week, uh, amongst many, but later in the week, was the fact that Michael Ryan had stepped down as Tipperary hurling manager. And last night, Dahi Regan joined us, and here's his reaction. Mike Ryan knows what's 
what's best for Michael Ryan. I mean, if you look at Mike's career, he's been involved in three All-Ireland wins as a player in 01, as a selector in 2010, and as the manager of the team that won in 2016. So he's put a huge amount into it. I do think it's interesting, the the um, the actual content of the release where he's talking about a new direction. And it may be, it, it may, very well may be a case that you must remember in the three All-Ireland successes over a 15-year period that Mike Ryan has been involved in Tipperary. Tipperary have played in a traditional Tipperary way, which has been a direct type of hurling. And that's what's, that's the kind of granite he's cut, cut from, and that's what he understands, and he understands what makes Tipperary tick, and he understands the demands that are, are within Tipperary. It very, it very well may be a case that he's looking at what's been played now. He's looking at player, and he's looking at Limerick, and it's possible Mike may feel that you know a new direction means that Tip may need to change the style of hurling, and that's not necessarily his his kind of forte to be able to, to change how we play because there's been suggestions that this year with Tipperary that it was kind of too one-dimensional, that it was just get the ball up the field and you rely then on kind of individuals and he has great forwards with great individual skill, but that certainly wasn't enough this year. So it is possible that they've sat down collectively, taken a look at it, how they can bring Tipperary forward and within that group dynamic with John Madden and Conor Stakelham, they may, may have felt that Listen, the way we're playing and the way the game has kind of moved, maybe we haven't moved with it. Interesting stuff from Dahi Regan on the show last night. Not an all that recent photograph of Dahi, it has to be said. Um, I mean, maybe one or two years old. Well, it, it, it gives him a bit of clout, you know. It's like he's been in the wars. He, he's uh, been at the top level of the game. For anybody who obviously didn't know, I'm sure everybody realises the, the clout from which he speaks. He got game. But yeah. That's exactly the, the phrase that was coming to my mind as well. Alan Proctor says, hockey's coming home. Uh, anyone know how to drive bandwagon? All aboard, really, is the, the short story on that. All aboard. I'm, I'm we've, starting... We've all become hockey experts, Owen, let's face it. You, you most especially. And I'm, I'm becoming uh, an expert in how terrible a nation Spain are as this morning <laughs> is progressing. Like, I'm starting to think to myself, Enrique Iglesias, is he all that? In fact, I think he's a bit shite. Wow. Penelope Cruz, was she ever that good? Is she, has she ever been a good actor? Wow. Like I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe Spain is a nation of cods, Adrian. PK, ne- not what, a, not never really. Forget the footballers, the footballers ah, are right, actually good. Sport, Let, yeah, let's yeah, actually yeah, forget yeah, about yeah. The, the footballers because there, there'll be a caveat to my argument that Spain are a nation of cods and uh, we will beat them on Saturday. What's the Spanish for cod? Anybody, anybody, any Spanish speakers out there that could sort of let us know? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's an in joke. Anyway, uh, it's 18 minutes past eight on this Friday morning. We've lots of good stuff coming your way. As I said a bit earlier, we're going to talk to Nicky Simmons to reflect on uh, that hockey goodness and to look ahead to that Spain game tomorrow as well. Like, sort of fascinated. What time is it? Uh, I saw two o'clock somewhere. It was supposed to be at half four, but then I read in the Irish Times this morning that it's actually going to be at two o'clock. Right. Um, so it's kind of like conflicting reports. Yeah, Ireland versus Spain at two o'clock, says the Irish Times, and then the Netherlands against Australia at half four. The final then, uh, which will be Ireland against the Netherlands, is on at half four on Sunday. Good, well, I look forward to that and set my reminders on it. Um, so that's coming your way. We've also got a very special uh, mini-doc that our own Andy Lee has been out and about in the last couple of weeks to chat with Seamus McDonough. This is a guy that uh, won't be on everybody's radar. He did fight Vander Holyfield at one point in his career, um, and as he'll tell you over the course of the documentary, that it wasn't an obvious fight necessarily for him to take on. It was a bit of a foolhardy fight by all accounts. He was stepping up and weight against one of the highly, most highly rated boxers in the, on the planet at that point, but uh, it did put him one step away from a $25 million payday. Uh, and let's face it, that's got to be temptation enough. So it's a really interesting story inside the ring. It's a really interesting story outside the ring as well and Andy uh, has sat down with Seamus McDonough. We're going to bring you that way, uh, bring that your way uh, before nine o'clock. So stay tuned for all of that good stuff. And Johnny Ward as well. He's still alive. He's still at uh, Ballybrit. Uh, we're in today five of the Galway Festival and there's lots of good stuff to look forward to today. Limony seems to be everybody's pick for the big one. So we're going to get Johnny's thoughts on that. I already know that uh, he's plumped for it. Yeah. Um, so we'll see uh, We'll see how we go on that. Yeah, it's got. it's been, I'm not sure how yesterday went, but certainly prior to that, it was a bit of a disaster for the punters. It's gone proper like oxygen 2009 over there as well, I presume with the What's rain, as in just mud everywhere. Right. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't quite think people are on wellies and you know raving, but ultimately I, I presume it leads to a rather unpleasant experience in certain parts of the race course. But uh, I'm sure most people are having a very very pleasant experience. The enclosure's uh, on; it's the only way to go. You know yourself. It's well, for you anyway, it's cool. You know, you know it, it, you, VIP action. Have you ever not been a VIP at a race course? 
Um, have you ever not yeah, worn yeah, a top yeah, hat yeah, at a yeah, race yeah. course? Yeah. Occasionally, I would have done. Yeah. Yeah, there was once. There was one time I didn't wear a top hat when I was about uh, twelve. Maybe I went to Roscommon races, and I wouldn't wear a top hat that day. But and what was your opinion about of the 13, plebs? Fourteen, I would have. What was my opinion of the plebs? Yeah, being down with the rest of us at the rest of the race course. <laughs> You're putting yourself in with the proletariat. I've moment, never been a, in a corporate section of a race course. I've always paid I mean, my I way in to. and you know done the honest thing. Give a few quid to the bookies. Right. You know, pay, pay your way through the racing. Uh, <laughs> the industry. honest thing thing and lose money. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're you're there to support the racing industry when you go to the state racing. You're not there to be one of the prawn sandwich brigade. I did I did actually my my first prawn sandwich experience ever was at racing. Bizarrely enough, and it wouldn't be a sport that I would have been um, madly into as a young fella. But uh, that was my first ever corporate experience. Whereabouts? Uh, Ferry House. I think it was right. Ferry House. Yeah. For the national. I don't know. I've absolutely no. What what I was. I was. I have no recollection what the hell we were doing there. Clearly, didn't appreciate your prawn sandwiches. Well, what I appreciated was, was I was there with my parents and a couple of their friends, and um, one of the friends had won a significant sum of money, all of which she gave to me. So that was sort of. I was like, all right. Why? Or like, I think she just appreciated that she'd she'd been invited for the day out. So okay, like, sorry. Yeah. I, I mean, it. it was way too generous, even though. What uh, What's a prawn sandwich actually like? I've never had one. I don't eat prawns. I think it's more of the sort of philosophy of something rather than the specifics of actually eating prawns. Okay, with you. fair enough. I'm allergic to them, so I just, I just kind of think... It's worth it. It's, it's worth it for the severe sure. allergic reaction to say that you had a prawn sandwich once. Um, Ronan Nagara, uh, speaking of prawn sandwiches, Ronan Nagara, I mean Cork and... Um, Go for it. He's back in the exam this morning. The rugby season is upon us, and he's been writing about how he's become a totally different person over his last eight months, nine months, with uh, the Canterbury Crusaders who are into the... Uh, final this weekend um, against one of these South African teams who I can't remember. Um, and he's talking about how he's become a totally different person, that he has been exposed to Scott Robertson, who's the uh, head coach of the Crusaders, and how he's just an incredibly positive guy. And uh, as O'Gara points out, that's not a typical Irish trait, that we tend to be a bit more of the um, sort of glass half empty. He's saying that Robertson is, the glass is not only just half... Uh, a glass that is brimming with confidence. No, confidence like, is different from positivity, though. Okay, fair enough. Even with positivity, I would say, like, like I think he's hit the nail on the head with the Irish public, perhaps. But with Irish high performance setups, I would have thought that positivity would have been a big factor. I'm surprised to hear that, and like you obviously take him at his word. So I'm surprised to hear that say, the, the Irish national team wouldn't have been brimming with with confidence or no sorry be, positivity. I think it can be subtle enough things like he's talking about at the Crusaders where they go into a game against the Highlanders and they're ravaged with in, injury and O'Gara goes up to Scott Robertson and he says listen like if ever the Highlanders are going to beat us it's this week which is a pretty Irish mindset you know and I suppose the other thing about it is like they're operating in that little bubble of conversation that they don't necessarily, they never have that conversation with the rest of the players, for example. So you sort of assume that you can have that conversation at that level and then deliver a different message, obviously, to the players. But uh, not on uh, Scott Robertson's watch. He's like, well, actually, I don't really view it that way. I kind of think that there's some of these players who are going to get their opportunity. The bank of evidence from the other players who've got their opportunity this season is that they've stood up to the plate. I believe we can beat the Highlanders this weekend and it's going to happen. And... Uh, Inevitably, they go out and hockey the Highlanders. Yeah, th the more you say that, and the more you say that it's not an Irish thing, the more I think of Gerlach Nan saying, we are going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it's something that isn't... But that's notable, and that's become Notable a because thing it's positive. Because nobody yeah. ever does it. Sure, right? yeah, it's, it's a fair point. I just thought perhaps that that was the, the curtain being pulled back that one time we got to glimpse inside the mind of a high-performance manager or coach or mm -hmm. motivator. I, I'm surprised to hear that, but I, I trust that uh, I trust that it's right. There's a lot of glass half empty people dealing in Irish sport, which is a shame. It's a curious thing. On a um, couple of other stories that we wanted to bring, we just wanted to reflect on the Williams story. Was one that particularly caught your eye this morning? Here it is in the Sun this morning. Chelsea shocker uh, William Fury uh, writes Tom Barkley here. Star calls in lawyers over transfer letter forgery. You've got the details of this one on. 
Yeah, so he's uh, furious with this, and it's interesting yeah. to know the, the motivation behind all this. Of course, the transfer window closes next week, next uh, Thursday, I think, at midnight. Uh, it's uh, set to close. So a lot of people making maneuvering attempts to get themselves out of clubs. I'm not saying Willian is one of those players. I'm just saying that he totally these, is, these right? two things are... Uh, Somebody sends in a letter, they get his signature on it, and it says that I'm giving, I mean, essentially a right of attorney to this group of players to manage where my future lies. If I, I, you know, I may get a transfer and they can look after it, right? So, who cares, right, that somebody has gone to the trouble of doing that? Like, that's some crank or whoever it is. Don't worry about it. Just, like, get the bit of paper, roll it up, chuck it in the bin, move on to your pre-season training, whatever the hell it is you're doing. The fact that you've become sort of so transfixed with this thing and you've put it up on Instagram, to me, suggests that actually... Uh, maybe this is not sort of a third party that William doesn't know too much about because, like otherwise, why the hell would you get so furious about it? You can't control, ultimately, some crank who decides that they're going to try and sort of create a bit of a story or, like, why the hell does he care about it? Yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, he says that he was rightly stitched up. Now, whether or not William actually used the term stitched up remains to be seen. But he uh, fumed <laughs> on his Instagram Unlikely. account. I have been informed that a letter of authorization for player agent FIFA, allegedly signed in my name, has been circulated in the football market. So there's this letter that's gone out where uh, Denny Robson Diaz, uh, William's current agent, uh, he gave to Mr. Rene Pinero Anuchiacho. Uh, the broadest consent by parties with the right on my behalf to request and represent in an exclusive manner to carry out my representation. This is the statement here. Uh, so basically, one agent falsely signing over the consent to William's rights to another agent. Uh, whether or not that other agent uh, exists remains to be yeah. seen. So this is obviously a bid from this guy, Anu Chiachau, to actually become William's agent. Now, I'm not sure about you, but <laughs> if you forge a letter... You can't suddenly act on behalf of that agent's player. You actually have to go and is that not the way it works? I would have thought that you would just send in the letter, and then William would go, "Ah, oh, crap! Well, sure, look, if that's the way it is, you're now my agent. Let's crack on." Is Surprisingly, that not the way it works? like granted, we don't know a lot about how modern football works. Mm -hmm. We don't know how it really works. But I'm going to stick my neck out here and suggest that, that is not the case. That William himself would probably have to go along with this new agent. I don't think he shows up and there's a, mi a strange man sitting in the room and he's like, I'm now your agent. Are you the guy that sent the letter? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. Look, it's come about quite unusually, but let's crack. How would he, like the big thing is, the real head scratcher for me is like, how would one procure the, because they've got William's signature clearly on the document. Like, it's real head scratcher for me as to how one would go about procuring the signature of a Premier League footballer. Oh, well, he could put on this. Yeah, I have no idea. There's definitely no opportunities online oh. or on eBay to find a, a signature of a press. Or just report. to rock up to a ground and go, hey, William, did you sign this thing for me. Like, it could've, he could have actually signed that thing and not have had a clue about it. They, they must have uh, threatened him threatened him to, and coerced him to actually sign the, the thing. So, uh, unfortunate story for William. And unfortunately, <laughs> he'll probably be turfed out of Chelsea and get himself a, a lovely new move somewhere. Or just get a pay rise at Chelsea. I, I do feel sorry for the man. Nearly half eight on this uh, Friday morning and we're going to talk hockey very shortly with a beautiful boxing mini doc to come your way as well so stay tuned for all of that good stuff but in the meantime it is a big weekend of the Super 8s we've Donegal Tyrone, Dublin Roscommon, Kerry Kildare and Galway Monaghan so all of that good stuff uh, on the horizon this weekend and to discuss it all I'm delighted to say we're joined on the line by uh, my always Lee Keegan good morning to you Lee how are you doing, guys? How are you? Very good. Thanks, million, for taking the call. First of all, before we get stuck into some of that analysis, we were uh, wondering, a Lara, a Lara Corbett documentary from a couple of years ago sprung to mind when I heard you were coming on, Lee, and I uh, don't know if you remember this one, but he was, Tiberi had been uh, put out of the championship a bit earlier than they would normally have been, and he was part of this documentary sitting in an empty ground saying, I don't know what the hell to do with myself. I absolutely, this is not something that's, uh, that I normally have to do. What have you been up to? Um... Yeah, well, I, I'll be honest, I haven't been sitting in the dark corner any of the last six weeks or five weeks anyway, so I, I definitely can confirm that. Um, <laughs> honestly, um, I suppose after the initial loss to Galera, just, you know, had a couple of days to reflect, uh, you know, kind of go for a few beers and catch up with the guys and maybe discuss what happened or what we could have done. And then after that, to be honest, I, you know, I kind of got back to work and back to club training the following week and just try and keep my mind occupied, to be honest. So, um if I'm honest, it's been a really hectic kind of four or five weeks between club. Uh, Socialising has definitely been, uh, it's gotten up uh, 100% since, since we've been knocked out and just kind of catching up with friends and family and bits and pieces like that. So it's, it's been really hectic from that point of view. And Joe, because of all these interactions and bits and pieces, that, you know, it's been really good for my head alone. And uh, you know, and I have seen Blair Corbett and, you know, I've always thought that as well. Maybe what, what would happen if we were to go out early or what would I do or how would he act? And to be honest, 
I have such a good probably uh, good people behind me that I, I haven't really had time to really you know, sit down and say well the year's over between one bit and another to be honest Were you on that uh, Gareth Brooks video? Uh, I was with uh, two or three others hiding in the background uh, I wouldn't be much of a singing man so I, I tried to say it as much as possible Well it turns out Aidan is not that much of a singing man either <laughs> <laughs> I broke up and I let you decide that. <laughs> <laughs> just one point on, on just something you mentioned there, just about you know meeting up with the players and picking through what went wrong for the course of the season. Was that um like is that just a cathartic thing that you discuss it and you sort of get it out and it's helpful to move forward, or is there a more concrete sort of well if we had have if you would have just done that and I'd have just done that and we'd have sort of tweaked it out in other ways? Is it which one of those is it? No, no. I suppose what we did, we we haven't really had a more formal meeting in terms of the year itself, and you know, I think it was just more just a general chat over a beer, you know, and just just in a different environment, and just saying, you know, we just kind of sat down together uh, and just said, listen, you know, what, what we're wrong and how could we have done better, you know, that kind of generic talk that you have over a few drinks. So yeah. it's just one of those things where you know, really and truly, like when we look back, and and when I look back, is I don't really have a complaint because if we were to if we were to lose that, and we were the better team. Maybe we could say, well, you know, tough on us. But to be really honest, you know, we came up against a team that were just maybe two or three percent uh, more had more intensity than us. And if I'm being brutally honest, they probably did their their game. Actually, they I did what we usually do. Teams they ran us really hard throughout the whole game. And to be honest, they could have won the game by six or seven points in the end. Uh, just one other thing, Lee, before we move on to the weekend's football, I just wanted to ask you about your appearance on the Saturday game there at the start of the Super 8s. How did you yeah. find that first foray into punditry? Um, interesting. Um, I suppose uh, it's, it's new to me. Um, again, it's, it's, it's filling kind of a gap in the void, and you know, watching some of the games that there is, is definitely different from my, from my point of view. Um, yeah, I suppose I have to brush up on some of my lingo with, with the likes of Joe and Tomas who've been there quite a long time um, and try and get my point across, maybe. But, you know, I, I actually really enjoyed it, to be honest. Um, I'd be a really enthusiastic GA fan outside of the obviously, and I, I love going up to games and watching what teams do or how they implement systems and tactics and plays. So for me, I was only delighted to get on and watch from a different different point of view for, for myself anyway, and try and take away a few points from the game. What's uh, been a tougher experience, uh, marking Dermot Connolly or being a pundit alongside Joe Brawley? I uh, drove Raleigh every day. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down, I. <laughs> Don't brush up on the lingo too much, Lee. That's the. No, uh, no, I tell you, it's like going into a ring with a, a haymaker of a punch and he catches that once and you're, you're hitting the ground. That's the game over. <laughs> I'd say you wouldn't be shy about sort of. Uh, no, with, with your imitate, you're going 12 rounds. So. <laughs> Um, right, talk to us a bit about the football at the weekend. There's some interesting stuff and obviously things to be decided, even though, for example, we start with Goa and Monaghan, they're already into the semis, but and we've yeah. just been discussing Dublin. Like, How much of a motivation and how much will it be spoken about, that idea of, obviously, they've got to win to avoid the dubs. It's a significant thing. Does that get spoken about much, do you think, this week, or how does that play out? How does it impact the game? Yeah, I, I suppose I thought about this game a bit as well. It, it's just it's a really tricky one uh, due to the nature of I suppose the setup. Like uh, we obviously know Gal we're into the semi already, but um, I you know it, it, going by Kevin Welch and the way he's kind of gone about the year, I, I don't really think they're worried about too much in the background. I I do honestly believe they're going to go for this game full hold or going to hold to be honest because I I think they see an opportunity to play another big team and to put down America again for the year. And to be honest, if the way they're going, the, 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 you know, people are criticising you know, the way they're playing and bits and pieces. But to be honest, I don't think Kevin Welch is going to really care, to be honest, because he's in the semi-final already. He's got the luxury now of saying, do you know what, hey, we're going to take another big team here at the weekend on our home patch. And um, Ronan, I think you know, for them as well, it's, it's really interesting. That, that I, I thought they were absolutely fantastic against Kerry. Uh, I think they're a really top team, to be honest, with some really top players. I think the the biggest... The problem for them at the moment is they need more, one more man scoring than what Conor Madison is scoring. I think they're shooting, kind of let them down in the in the latter stages when they have the game by, by the collar. So it's definitely going to be a really interesting one. If, if I'm to call it, and really, I, I really do think Man and are going to go for it hard. And I do think they're going to tip them maybe by one or two points. But, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a really intense, tough battle with a lot of, let's say, off-the-ball stuff that we're not going to see on camera. Yeah, and we can see how well Galway have done from the uh, table on screen there. Just yeah, yeah, of course. And listen, that's... I suppose Kevin is always he's not shy about saying they had tough mistake in terms of his Cali over the last couple yeah. of years. He prior to even beating us and from our point of view they've beaten us three years in a row and we that's something we've experienced first time between league and championship that they've really up the physical stakes and do you know what I I you can only commend them because they're winning games I know it's not pretty at times, but if you're winning games like that you know, they'd be killed there by a couple of points. Now, they are saying that I suppose 
to be a really top team. They're not really they're not getting rid of teams quicker. They're keeping they're keeping the likes of there in the game that time when they could have they could have went further on and a man up as well. So that'll be a bit of a concern for Kevin uh, if if they come to that situation again. They really need to press harder and get get more of the top players. And for me at the moment, I think you know we're talking with the likes of Shane Welsh and Damien Comer, but I I think what I Ian Burke at the moment these guys are not going to be getting on half the water scores as they are. I just think. He's, he's like a little uh, wizard or a little messy in there on the, on the top of the D, and every, his hands are just absolutely magnificent to watch. I tell you, he's one of the nicest players I've seen. Not nice, but one of the most mm. skilled and influential players you, you see out there, and, and his unselfishness has been seen over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, like ultimately, Mayo have got as close as anybody to this uh, Galway team this summer. What was your plan against them? Um. I suppose our plan was uh, we, we we dropped a lot of numbers back um, to try I suppose to negate their attack. We, you know, we're very wary of what they have up front and like for Shane Welch and Damien Comer. And I suppose we got first hand in the league what they did do to us at times when we 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 all kind of flooded forward at numbers and what they could do on the counter attack. So it was really just trying to combat their counter and trying and try and get a nice not, not a slow build up but try and pick pockets where we could. And we did that well at times. I suppose the send off maybe had some form of influence in the first half. But if you look at the overall context of the game, we actually had a lot of chances. And when it came down to the, the, the team that had the one goal chance was Galway and the, and the buried it and Johnny Heaney. So, like, our, our plan was to, I suppose, get a turnover and a counter attack as quick as possible because they do, they do sometimes commit numbers to their attack. Um, and we did identify that and we did start really well. But again, just, I suppose, when it came down to the last few minutes, our legs kind of ran out and the injury to Tom Parsons, the send off, you know, I think that's had a bit of a brunt on the team towards the end. Yeah, and even like Monaghan are a bit of an unknown uh, quantity, obviously, as well. So we'll see big expectations that they haven't really fully met. So we'll see how that one uh, pans out. That's Galway, Monaghan, in yeah, Salt Hill. Good. We'll move on to Donegal, Tyrone, Ali, just to Bally Buffet on Sunday. It's one of the more interesting games of the weekend. Donegal, obviously, with this long, unbeaten run in Bally Buffet, 21 games, three of which have been against uh, Tyrone, yeah. um, and a place in the semi finals, obviously, up for grabs with the winner here as well. Where exactly do you see this? Uh, Tyrone team at they're another one that are sort of hard to get a bit of a fix on yeah um, I suppose if we look at the Tyrone Dublin game you know that was, it was it was a brilliant brilliant game for us to watch as neutrals and uh, spectators so um, I'd be expecting Tyrone to come out really hard uh, I'm sure they'll be well aware as you mentioned that they've got up there three times in the last year and got beaten so that'll be in the back of the mind and obviously there's a bigger fight for both teams within if there's a semi-final, so um, that's going to add huge incentives now. I think there's a bit of talk on uh, Tyrone that my dandy could be could be absent to the game at the weekend. And for me, if if that's the case, I think you know the pendulum could swing just slightly towards Donegal mm. because his influence in games is huge. Although I did think he struggled against Dublin, you know when he did likes against Dublin, they, they did the matchup so well. So I think for him, not to be involved the weekend will be critical towards how Tyrone Tyrone's game plan is going to set up. Um, but yeah, just looking at, at Donegal, I was really impressed. Now people say that you know Ross Gammon is struggling to grace, but I was really impressed that Declan Bonner changed things up a small bit and put Michael Murphy in the edge of the square where we all want to see him. Um, I thought he was absolutely fantastic. You know, obviously he's not going to get the same space or time against Tyrone, but from a new point of view, to see him up there doing what he does best was was really good. And the likes of Ray McHugh, um, I, I don't know if Bon Gallers will be there or not. Another huge player for them. I, I picked him up at the start of the year, saying he's definitely uh, he's looking at all star the way his year was going. So. I think it's going to be, a, a re, again, a really tight game. Uh, I think it'll be very nervy for the first, first 20, 25 minutes um, until we, hopefully we'll have a goal to kind of liven up. So for me, I, I do think maybe the Bally Buffet, the Maidanity factor, I, I do think Donegal might have just that, just a couple of, or a couple of incentives for the weekend. Yeah. Uh, but it's a huge, huge incentive for both teams, to be honest. Yeah, you're right about Gallagher. It'll be interesting to see if he plays the the yeah. and the Bally Buffet factor, of course. But um, from a drone point of view, you obviously like you beat them in the 2016 uh, yeah. quarters. I don't remember Lee who scored the uh, the winning point that day. There was only a point between them. But um, what's the like? What's the? They are difficult. Like they were picked apart, obviously by by Tyrone in the semi-finals last year, and everybody like Sean Cavanaugh was out, and he was very critical about sort of Plan A and only Plan A and Plan A wasn't really working. Are you seeing yeah. something different in Tyrone this year? I mean, those injuries aside, that might point to the possibility of going a bit further this year. Yeah, well, I suppose we've seen them. Up, I, people say that they're up in Oma playing Dublin. That was a bit of a factor, but we all know the way Dublin play and the way they go about their game. So I don't know about that, but. Just looking at the way they're playing, they seem to be a bit more freer in what in their game plan now. I haven't seen a lot to suggest their their plan has changed dramatically. To be honest, it's very, still very much based around running harder teams, looking for the likes of your Floodens, your uh, Hart. You know, lead, these guys trying to lead the way in terms of scoring. So again, I, I suppose I'm going to be crazy about them. Like I would have been very impressed with how they're gone in the in the two super games. To be honest, they put up a huge score in Cool Park against Oscarman. 
really pushed Dublin hard up to the last two or three minutes. But we all know how Dublin finish games. So I, I would be very positive in the way that they have been playing and how they're scoring. But I, I still don't see... I haven't seen a huge change. In the, like I said, you, you talk about a plan A. I, I still don't see a plan B if things go really belly up in terms of if Tyrone get a big run or Donegal get a big run in them mm. in the first 15, 20 minutes. How are they going to respond to that? Are they going to stick to the same game plan they have? Are they going to retreat numbers and run hard from there? So for me, I, I, I haven't seen a huge change, but I have seen a huge confidence change in the way they have been playing and the way they are, the way they're demanding the ball, the way they're responding to the team. So, it's, it's not a huge change in their game plan, but they do look, they do look a lot more confident and they do look like they're ready to, to, to battle up in Bally Buffet at the weekend. Yeah, you, you would suspect that the matchups, there'll be a lot of focus on that from both yeah, camps this week because yeah. they like to do that in, in this clash. They like to do it in a lot of Ulster clashes where they pick a certain man and they like to target him. And ultimately, you wouldn't be surprised if it's a, a hot encounter on uh, Sunday where it's a testy affair where there might be a bit of a psychological battle going on. And I do wonder how big a factor that is in intercounty football at the moment where teams are just basically trying to wind each other up. Yeah, yeah. But like that was, I suppose, Tyrone kind of got like, like Tyrone against Dublin to a degree because you're talking about Tyrone, you know, been very proud of their matchups and, you know, trying to get the best players. If you look at the Doma game, Dublin got their matchups 100% right. Like, took out Peter Hart, they took out Sludden, took out Valley Donnelly, three of their key players, Tyrone, and that, they read the heartbeat. So it, it is going to be really interesting to see how they do shape up against Donegal. Now, in terms of matchups, I think it's going to be difficult. To, obviously, they're going to be targeting Murphy and Ed Square is there. But like in terms of matchups, there probably won't be a lot because, again, when we look at the likes of these games, it's very much, I suppose, defensive focus. So you'll have a lot of counter attack with players picking up maybe a different guy that he's marking the stairs or a different guy. So you would be just picking up lads that's over in the past. So I think it's going to be a really feisty and bitey affair. Um, I think Donegal will bring a huge physicality to Valley Buffet. We, we've seen that over the years and they've really intimidated teams from the start, from the throw in. So that that's going to be a key factor how that throw and goes and who gets the first score and that's going to set the set the tone early and I'll be honest I think the referee is going to really have to stamp his authority early in the game if he's if if you know he doesn't want to things fired out control early because we know how that goes and especially in Ulster affairs that things can go over the edge quite quite quickly if it's let and uh, I think the referee is going to have a huge job on that at the weekend. Just before we wrap, um, I mean, I think no, nobody's really expecting any great surprises at Crow Park between Dublin and Roscommon. Dublin already threw, of course, with a game to spare there. Uh, and I actually don't know really what even constitutes a surprise in the uh, Kerry Kildare game. Lee, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, 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 they're, obviously the Roscommon Dublin game, maybe just a word, like to say that you know, people have criticised Roscommon hugely in the Super 8s. But I suppose if you look at it through the year, they've got promoted, they've got some chronic violence, Charles Galway, they made the Super 8s. So, I, I'd be less critical of first Garmin, to be honest. Now, I still think they're a long way off, maybe the top, top eight teams. And now people can say we didn't make it ourselves, and that's the case. But we, we've been challenged for years, so I, I think it'd be a bit unfair. But for us, Garmin, I think this is a huge learning lesson for them to go forward the next couple of years. They are probably five, six players short of competing against some of the top teams. Um, but for Kevin McSay, I think it's been a huge learning curve. And going to Cork Park at the weekend and just say, Joe, hey, just throw off the shackles. If we get beaten by 20 or 10, whatever it is, at least we try to play the game in the right manner in the right way. So I think it's an opportunity for them. A low confidence could be at a huge low. And then the Kerry Kildare game, I suppose we've had Kildare first hand. So they've been quite lucky to be honest in the two breaks. I thought they performed very well in the first two games. Again, just probably didn't have that clinical edge in the two games. When they're in the game, to be honest, they could have put the foot on a bit more and went, went harder teams um, like they did against us. So I, I do think to be honest, I do think Kerry are going to be maybe five, six, seven points better at the weekend. But they're they're very much uh, dependent on how the Man and Golo game goes. And that it's going to be a really interesting weekend from that point of view. So, listen, I'm, I'm hoping for a great weekend of football. I, I suppose after the hurling weekend last week, it's probably going to be hard to top the quality, the excitement, and the tension and all that. But you know, football has reduced it for years and years on end. So I can't see why you know, we're letting the hurling dictate so much this year. I know it, it deserves pundits and the applause and all that because it has been spectacular, but. So I think this is this the weekend that hopefully really fires up the football and gets everyone talking about it again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just one last one for me, Lee. Then it's like obviously that result in Clarny could be completely futile depending on what happens in Salt Hill on tomorrow evening. Yeah. Like when you were facing Kerry last year in that All Ireland semi final replay, were you surprised by how they altered in the second match and how they kind of went completely defensive and in a defensive system that essentially shot themselves in the foot? And you, you walked home then in the end, you were by far the better team then in yeah. the end in the second match. And it does seem that when you kind of analyse games where Kerry have been in the melting pot this year, the likes of the Galway game in particular, that there has been a failure of systems. I'm not sure, would you agree with that, having no, seen it up close last year and how much they've come on this year? More from a defensive point of view as well, I, I think 
they're very they look very uncertain of how to mark a uh, mark a forward or a top forward. Like to be honest, we, we could all see, and uh, you know, Conor Granis had one one after about four minutes against Kerry, and Fitzmaurice was very nervy changer for so long because I don't think he was re- he, he could rely on anyone else, maybe Stewart or. For me, like Paul Murphy would be their best back. Uh, I I would have him as the man marker to be honest because I, I've got to I suppose mark him for a stand or play against him for a stand. I would see him as one of the really top players in the country. Um, but yeah, there just seems to be like for me when as you mentioned that that whole wholesale changes like from say the goal game to to the mana game. It, I just find that a bit dramatic and maybe you know things are not as smooth as they were from from Munster to the Super Eight and maybe that's a sign that. They're just not as confident and, and taken. And I, I'd be more kind of inclined to look at their forward line, to be honest. I, I looked at Paul Gee at the weekend. I thought he looked very off, off par, maybe he's carrying injury. You know, he had three shots in the first 10 minutes and he, he converted on them. James O'Donnell came on, didn't get a score, maybe had one shot. You know, they relied on uh, Danny to get one flick to, to keep them in the game. Now, they're lucky that they've played for at the moment because he's really stepped up to play and kept Kerry in the championship, to be brutally honest with you. He, he was, in you know, two games so far, he's, he's hit 2-7, I think, and you know, all from play. So I think he's been absolutely fantastic for Kerry, and he's really he's really stepped up the senior like at a breeze, at a knees. To be brutally honest, so I think the young guys are really setting up for Kerry. I think this needs needs some of the old rear guard now to really you know go out, go out to there to again. I still think they're going to win, to be honest. But if they do get the result, I don't know how much more they can they can offer in the semi final like ourselves last year. Or you know, when we played them in the replay, we couldn't get over how how much space and time they afford us and. They just give us so much time to press them so hard for the full game that, as I said, we actually ran out quite easy winners and then. So it, it'll be, it will be interesting to see if they do get through. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think it, it's going to be very tough for them, to be honest. Yeah, interesting stuff, all right. And we look forward to the weekend. Listen, we don't want to let you awfully before asking. It is that time of the year that you get the sort of general um, turnaround of managers and management team. And Mayo haven't been any different than that this year with some of the backroom staff. Uh, uh, announcing that they're departing this week. Tony Buckley's gone and Peter Burke has gone and it seems like Tony McEntee might go, all of which suggests that Stephen Rochford is going to stay on. I know he does have another... Uh, he's contracted in so much as that is a thing um, for another year. What's your thought on that? I mean, I think you've been there six or seven years, obviously maybe three different management teams. In terms of that consistency, is it good timing for Mayo that there's a bit of a, a turnaround at this stage? Um, honestly, I, 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 I don't... It's hard to know, to be honest. Um, I, suppose, I said, like, change, say change is a good thing sometimes, but I suppose from Stephen's point of view, to lose probably three of the guys that have been with us very well over the last three years and really developed us and pushed us to, to the brink of all Ireland, you know, that's, that's tough to see. And them guys, you know, they owe us nothing in terms of they don't need to justify why they left. You know, they have their family lives, their travel lives, they have their work lives, and bits and pieces. So, like, we, we owe them hugely for what they've done with us. So, I think the, the the biggest thing for us probably is where do you go to look for people, to be honest. Is that, like, there isn't a huge pick out there at the moment because a lot of the top guys are already with teams or they're busy with other, other sports or whatever. So I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for us is to try and get a backroom team together. And, you know, I, obviously Stephen's well aware of that and Stephen's smart enough to know that, you know, yeah, he's going to have to look, look hard and look, look, look somewhere to, for these people now. Obviously, may open one of the top teams. I think it is quite appealing and, and there should be good interest because, Again, we have a lot of top players, and you know we should be very confident next year of you know coming back in January and putting in a huge year again. So you know, from the player point of view, we're not worried about that. But it's just it's to who do you look to, where do you go to find it? You know, it's not that easy to say right. We've got we've lost three of our best guys in terms of backroom. How do you replace them three guys, or where do you replace them? So that'll be Stephen's biggest challenge now over the next couple of weeks. You know, uh, again from the player point of view, we're just waiting for I suppose notification and make sure he's been ratified again. So. I can't really be saying too much about that because I don't know myself, to be brutally honest. So, um, again, we're we're very interested to hear what's going to happen. But I suppose from a player point of view, at, the, at this time, it's very much just club focus. So when we get a call to meet up, maybe, and, and discuss with the team where we're going and what we're going to be after next, maybe from, from the winter onwards, then then we'll we'll get a good idea of what we're, we're looking at for the year ahead. But the three guys leave, yeah, I'd be honest, I, I would have had a very good relationship with three of them, three, three different types of guys now in terms of how to look at the game and how to, to approach the game. So, um yeah, so it's 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 sad times because we lost uh, to Kildare, but it was sad to see some some of the some of the main guys go like that. And uh, yeah, so far the players are sticking tight, and you know they're just going about their business, enjoying a bit of downtime. time. And again, once 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 the hall comes around again, we meet up. I'm sure that'll get the the blood book going again. So.
Yeah, absolutely no doubt. If there were any good club managers knocking around Westport, you could have some sort of a, like a super no, management we're, we're, team. We're that would. We're keeping him for another while. He's like coffee, so we have to keep. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, thanks a million. Enjoy the games no, the weekend. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Lee Keegan. There, uh, looking ahead to the Super Eight games uh, this weekend. What do you think about that idea? It suddenly struck me there that a James Horan, uh, Stephen Rochford, super management team. I mean, joint managers has always worked out in Mayo, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, whether or not. Uh, to people who've had the Helen to themselves would add up to the, some of their parts rem, would yeah. very much remain to be seen I would think if uh, they could be sold the dream that this is going to put Mayo as close as, as possible to sort of reaching out and touching the void it's such, an, it's such a weird situation that they're in what more can they do mm. when you look at last year what more can they do sack the manager that's like I mean that I'm, I'm not saying that's what they should do I'm fate. saying that's what generally tends to happen they when, when they look around and go, what more could we do? Where can we find these inches? Generally, it tends to be, ah, right, you you go now, we'll get somebody else in. Like You've got to look at the last two All-Ireland Finals as two of the best losing performances we've ever seen. Yeah. Like The replay or the first game, it's hard to say in 2016, but certainly last year was one of the best losing performances we've ever seen. It's very hard to realise how you get back to that. Maybe it's, you know, focus more on Connacht. If they had Lee playing against Galway and Castlebar and made a 13th this summer, they mm. might have beaten them, and we might be talking about them uh, up against Monaghan this weekend, you wouldn't know. So it could have been a very different situation. The margins are so bloody tight in this game that, you know, I'm, like, it doesn't take me to tell Mayo people how tight those margins are given all the pain they've gone through over the last decade. Mm. Um, the under 20 final, obviously, I mean, in terms of where Mayo can go differently from here, they're obviously uh, contesting the under 20 final at the weekend against uh, Kildare at Crow Park. Uh, Lee Keegan actually six. Club mates involved uh, involved in that game, so um, I mean, it also means that James Horn is working with those players, and Stephen Rochford gives it a bash for another year, and suddenly there's a new impetus of the old guy coming back in and bringing a bunch of these players with him. And well, maybe James Horn becomes Mayo hurling manager and steals all those great players and turns them into hurlers. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should see. I mean, because it works out for every county that where you've got uh, impetus and new players that come in at the start of the season and they have a really positive impact on the team, and you, you know, things develop along to the point where you've been spoken about as Ireland, all Ireland contenders on. What are you talking about, Kerry? Are, are you saying they're all Ireland contenders? No. Why not? I'm saying that they. You're been, saying they're not all Ireland contenders. Exactly. I'm saying that I I tipped them for the All Ireland start of the year and the best of all the young players that were coming through and the old guard that were there and it was a good match. It just hasn't. I, I don't and think you're, anybody's you're, tipping them for all our success at this stage. You're categorically ruling them out. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm looking forward to playing that clip very, very shortly. Uh, off the ball is Cork Bound on Saturday. It's a very special show that we're bringing your way. We want you to join us for a special Saturday panel. It includes living legends Rena Buckley and Sonia Sullivan off the ball broadcasting the Saturday panel ahead of the Camogie quarterfinals of Porky Cueve uh, at the newly refurbished iconic Cork Stadium. Sonia, Rena. Karen McCarthy, the journalist, and Christina Donovan, who's the Deputy Director of Sport at UCC, are going to join our own Cleaner Foley to discuss the stories from the week. So it's a very special show. It's in advance of uh, the Camogie Quarters, and it's at Parky Cueve. And tickets, a small number of tickets are still available, so you can just head along to offtheball.com and uh, get yourself a couple of those sweet tickets for that. It's going to be a bloody good show. Just on the, sorry, just to come back to the young players' point. Like, what right-minded person thinks oh, there's uh, a batch of new young players coming into the squad, <laughs> uh, therefore they're going to win the All-Ireland this year? Like, but, uh, well, what's the... Whenever has that had that instant impact? Are, are you not saying... Are you not putting your money on 2020 or something? No, it, like, it was a case of... Look, Lee Keegan, obviously, like, I mean, you just heard him speak about what Mayo did to them in the replay last year and how they were a bit astonished by the room they were given so that points to like you listen to that and you hear well there's no way they could have won the All-Ireland this year if that's what's happening but well, that's, that but, also suggests a humongous underachievement but they were so my point is that there were a team that were there thereabouts right could have won yes. could have won the first day could have exactly. given an All-Ireland final so at that point they're absolutely All-Ireland contenders right so they're there thereabouts they've got a couple of two, maybe three young players that have come through that have been spoken about in unbelievable terms even in a Kerry context so that's the little, the uh, grain of sand, the, the grain of rice, yeah, yeah. to borrow the Kerry vernacular. And what did you make, of their, what did you the make of their performances last Sunday week? I was on holidays and I didn't see it. Well, they were their best players, I'll tell you that. There was four youngsters who, yeah. who stood up and they were their best players. So, like, I, Actually, it, I saw some of it. And, and also one of the old guard who creates the goal at the end. Like, and so, everybody in the prime of their career didn't show up. So 
Like, obviously it's not in their hands, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting down a wormhole of emotion here. <laughs> we, love, we love you for it, Owen. OTBAM is live with Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. Now, it is time to turn to boxing. Last week, Andy Lee uh, sat down with James McDonough. He's an Irish boxer with a pretty incredible story. In 1990, when Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson and derailed a Tyson-Holyfield mega fight, McDonough was drafted in to be Evander Holyfield's next opponent. Outside of the ring, he battled with alcoholism and he lived with a brain injury long after his boxing career. He eventually became a successful director and actor. Enjoy it. Just to go back, how did you get into boxing? My father was a fighter in, uh, in London. Uh, reluctantly, I was with, I, I did what the owl had said. Mm. Did you feel he forced you to box? Do you think you would have boxed if he, he didn't push you or influence you to box? Never would have fought. Really? No. I mean, I might have tried it. Did I, you feel right? like you had, you, you had a natural instinct for it or was something that you had to really work on? I, I, my brother John, who actually won more amateur uh, acclaim than I did, uh, he was a better boxer than me, tougher, he was smaller than me. So uh, he, he was, he's a tougher, tougher man than me. <laughs> so he uh, was a great, great fighter and he did, I don't think he really liked it that much either, but he was more na naturally, it came more natural to him. Me, I hated it when I was a kid. I just. I guess uh, I'm also a recovered alcoholic. So for some reason, as alcoholics, we are very sensitive, you know, and um, the people ask you, why did you quit fighting? I said, I became allergic to getting hit in the head, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so but we did it, you know, uh, because you know, choice like, really, you know? For a person, for a fellow doesn't like, didn't like the sport, to go as far as you did, mm. to eventually end up fighting Amanda Holyfield. Mm. How did that, how does that happen? This is, it's a, it's a long story. I'll give you a, a brief uh, a synopsis of it. I ended up uh, fighting with a May Mayo team against a Chicago team in Chicago back in the, in the 80s. And my father came over with me. So then remember, I came back and he stayed there. Uh, and then he eventually moved to New York. And so in the early 80s, my sister Rosalind and I moved to New York. And uh, I came from Enfield to Brooklyn, so it was quite a change, quite a shock. And it was great in the beginning, and then I, then I uh, got a job driving the horse and carriages around the park in, in, in Manhattan, and, which was a great job, and making a rake of money. And I was drinking a lot then, you know, I was, I was only young, you know. How old have you been? When I started the horse and carriages, I was about uh, 20, mm -hmm. yeah. And by the time I was 21, almost 22, I... Uh, found myself drinking way too much and uh, drove in a blackout and woke up one morning with a scar halfway on the sidewalk, halfway on the street, thinking, "What? I'm 21, what am I doing? I'm ruining my life, I can't stop drinking. So I swore off drinking. Were you also boxing alongside all this? I had been in the Golden Gloves two years before that. Mm. I lost in the quarterfinals, usually the eventual, to the eventual winner actually both times. And it was a very close fight too. Uh, well, anyway, I'm a real boxer. We never get beat. No one can ever beat us. You know, <laughs> we're always robbed. <laughs> so um, that year, I started training on January 4th for the Golden Gloves, and they start February. So February 1st was my first fight. Not a lot of time. No, yeah. but back then you're young. I was 20, 21, or maybe 22 at the time. Uh, 22. But that, but uh, the previous years, I had like had like eleven fights over the three years in the Golden Gloves. I never got a decision because I was always with the wrong club. You just you know political stuff. So uh, I started fighting, and I, I knocked all the guys out in '85 for the uh, to win the title. You know, win the uh, heavyweight title. I was really only a cruiserweight because only weighed 190. But uh, I forget your question, Andy. <laughs> How did you lead up? So you've you've won the yeah. Golden Gloves. Yes. You're, you work your way up to be a contender yeah. in the cruiserweight division. I was really a cruiserweight, yeah. Yeah, you were ranked number three in the world at one stage. Yeah, and yeah. then you move up to heavyweight. 
Well, what happened was uh, I took a fight against a guy named uh, Cecil Coffey. I had a very good record. In, I think he was 19 and 2 with 18 knockouts. And initially when I saw the record, I said, gee, why am I fighting this guy, you know? Uh, so I looked at the papers, I can beat that fella, you know? And it was a tough fight, uh, won that fight well. But a great, very uh, exciting fight. And I fought a guy named Michael Greer, he was world ranked also. And then they, all of a sudden, they had me ranked number nine in the world's heavyweights, but three as a cruiserweight. So in, in, in uh, February or so of 1990, the biggest shock in boxing history, um, the invincible Mike Tyson gets knocked out by Buster Douglas. So threw the whole boxing world on its head because, because the biggest fight of the year of the century was supposed to be, or any of the decade, was supposed to be Holyfield against Tyson. So I guess they looked in the rankings, they saw that had a huge following on, on, the, on the east coast of America. So they asked me to fight Holyfield and we said, I'm going to fight Holyfield. He, I'm, I'm a cruiserweight. He's the one, number one in the world, heavyweight. And then they came back a week later and they says, okay, but if you beat him, you'll make 25 million in your next fight. So we had to take it, you know. Would that have potentially been against Tyson? No, because Buster Douglas was the champion. Okay, yeah. 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 See, then I actually did, I, did, I, I didn't do great against, against Holyfield, but I got, got him a few slaps. <laughs> and time is the night Douglas beat Tyson. Mm. Night, which ended up having huge implications for you in your life. Yes. Where were you that night? I was actually watching it in Staten Island uh, at the Buchanan's, which is behind my girlfriend's house, the Rossi. She was Rossi uh, in February of 1990. Yeah. yeah. And no idea that this none, this was going to play none. all out, and you were going to play a, a role in this. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, so we had the, f- the fight was set up and. Uh, uh, <laughs> Little, we didn't have really enough time to, to get ready, but we got, we was fine, so I was in good shape. But, but mentally, I wasn't prepared at all, you know, and, but, and all, that, all that attention. I mean, was, I mean, I was talking to Trump, and I was talking to, not that I wanted to talk to him, I was talking to all these people, and, and uh, all these interviews, and all these phone calls. It's like, the, you know what it's like, Andy, the barrage of... of uh, what yeah. did Trump say to you? <laughs> he actually came into the dressing room after the fight, and he says, you put up a great fight. He says, we want you to fight here again. Mm because a lot of people came down to see me, you know? Yeah. So. It was a great fight. In terms of, well, Holyfield, you could see, without being disrespectful, was maybe a class above yeah. or had more potential to go, go further at that stage. But for, certain, for, like, for periods in the rounds, you were definitely in the fight. And the exchange, the final exchange, it was a real trade-up. Like, you could have been an inch either yes, way of... Yeah. of Either of you going down? Yeah. Would you believe I've thought about that for the last uh, 25 years ago, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, Jeannie Mike. I've thought about that fight probably almost every day for the last 28 years, you know? Mm. It, it, like, it never leaves us. How does, it, how does it sit with you now? Well, of course, I always you know, kind of wish it was different, you know, and I wish I'd just calm down a bit and, and not try to knock out the number one habit in the world. <laughs> I wish I'd just uh, relax more and, and uh, take it easy and, and, uh, and just moved around, not try to knock them out, which was, which was a bit of an insane, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, You spoke, I read that you spoke about when you stepped in during the first round that you felt fear. Do you think that... You, do you think the... Re- the way you fought was a reaction to that fear or? P- possibly, because, um, you know, as you know, mentally, I wasn't prepared for that fight. How, how so? Well, I didn't even have a mental uh, practice, you know. Mm. I mean, now I, I, uh, I'm actually, oh, I'm also, you know, I'm 22 years sober and, and uh, that's been the biggest fight of my life, you know, I've been staying sober, but it's not even, uh, it's not even a fight. Uh, staying sober is, trying to control the thoughts in the brain, uh, which uh, I've been shown how to do with the 12 steps, which I wish I had back then, because uh, they just, they, they eradicate all the fear and you're in reality. And the, when you're in reality, there's nothing to fear, you know? So I com- became completely overwhelmed. When the bell went, I could barely even walk, you know? I was like, oh my God, you know? and. And I found out now that I, I, would, I was actually blocking all the nerves out for days before and weeks before, blocking them out, trying to shut it all off, all the, all the noise in your head. And when the bell went, it all hit me. You know what that's like. I know, yeah. If you're not dealing with it, it's going to be there. 
So when the bell went, it all hit me. And, uh, and you're in the, in the ring with the one number one heavyweight in the world, you know. It's not the best time to lo start losing it, you know. Mm. So I... Uh, uh, but you fought him. You, yeah. Like you, yeah, yeah. You did fight him. You weren't just in there, you know. Yeah. Like, you weren't making up the numbers. And exactly. Landed. Yeah, I, I tried to... He I knew tried. you were there. He did, he did. Because... Uh, we, you know, we've, in the boxing world, you know all these people, and he's he's very respectful of me, you know. And I've seen him quite a few times since, and and uh, I actually showed him the picture of uh, of uh, I got him a great shot in the fourth round. <laughs> I showed him the picture. Right hand that we've seen in the preliminaries and now in the semifinals is something that I don't know seemed to come all of a sudden. Did you have it? To, you must have had it, but how did you develop it this well? I've always had a pretty good punch, and uh, it's a I've here been working out huh? on the back. <laughs> as as it changed a little bit as well. <laughs> so the right. Quick right after the left. What's your big dream, Seamus? Well, in boxing, I'd like to be world champion. Yeah. Uh, I guess boxers and everything, you know, in life, I'd like to maybe do something with the troubles in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Maybe, you know, try and stop all the killing and violence. Yeah. Um, hopefully, United Ireland, but, you know, we've got to try and get peace there. Yeah. Um, but in boxing, I'd like to be world champion. Yeah. Where are you going? Are you St. John's now? Yeah, I'm going to St. John's. Where are you studying? Adam. Well, I'm studying liberal, ar liberal arts. Uh -huh. uh, I'd like to go into law, maybe. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm undecided at the moment. Uh -huh. But, uh, I'm, you know, enjoying it over there. A lot of nice guys over there. Well, I, I've watched your career, you know, right from the start, from the kid gloves on up. Uh, you have the desire to be a boxer, don't you? Really want to be a boxer? Yeah, you got it's. It's probably um, the hardest of all sports. You got to be. Uh, How do you feel watching this? It's it's kind of a you know, I don't know. I just uh, in shock really a little bit. Huh? <laughs> How so? Well, back then, I you're so innocent and you don't know what's going on, you know, and and uh, and, uh, and it, it can, you know, there's a lot. As you know, it's, I mean, like getting into professional sports, professional boxing especially, it's so. I have to say, just so corrupt, you know. Mm. Um, I wasn't affected that much. I mean, I didn't make a whole lot of money out of it. I am so grateful to come out with a lot of, not so too much damage. You spoke about maybe wanting to be a lawyer and, and studying, you know, literature and, and uh, fine arts in college. And yes. um, I think you even mentioned about brokering a peace deal here in Nor when the Northern Ireland Troubles. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any regrets that you didn't follow those things, that you stuck to boxing? And, do, like, looking back, how do you feel about it? Do you think you could have took it? how your life would have been different had you taken a different course? Of course, I've, I've thought about that often. Uh, and I actually don't regret a thing, mm. you know. Uh, I, I do have to say that, um, you know, I fought, I fought for 18 years. I mean, if I, you're not fighting all the time, but you're sparring a lot, you know, in, especially in, in the pros. And uh, you do get memory loss, you know. I've had... I, 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 uh, in my last fight, uh, I got badly beaten. I got a headbutt in the second round. I fought in a blackout for seven or eight rounds. I wasn't even aware of the fight was going on. I wasn't conscious. So I got battered for that. And he got some, I got some, that was like a TBI, a traumatic brain injury for that, in that fight. And it affected me for years. It still affects me somewhat, you know. So, uh, I've forgotten the question again. <laughs> <laughs> no regrets. Not really, no. I mean... Uh, of course, I wish I'd made more money, mm. but that's. I look. I look at. I know a lot of very wealthy people, and money doesn't fix anybody either, you know. And and uh, I. I ha but I have to say that I'm. I'm. I'm like happy. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, and and people kind of would ask me like, "What do you do?" You know. And and uh, all I can say really is that uh, for the last 22 years I've been sober, and some 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 lad in in San Francisco showed me how to. Because everyone has problems, you know, and this is not a therapy course here or anything, you know. But everyone has problems. But how to deal with the how to deal with the the problems? Mm. And I do I do a writing and meditation practice. I've done it every morning for 22 and a half years. I did it this morning, mm. and it it uh, helps you, your brain, which is which is not uh, trained to deal with this world, you know. It helps you uh, deal with all your problems, and then you you know. 
when, when, when you're free of problems, you can, you can be creative and, and try things you want to do and do, do anything you want, really. You don't have to, but can you reveal to us what you write down? Is there like a mantra or is it well, like, more I, personal? No, I can reveal. Uh, uh, it's probably never been revealed before on TV, but we'll see. The, the, the meditation, I do a meditation called Transcendental Meditation. Works for some people uh, and doesn't work for others, you know. But it worked for me, and it was and it was, it was a great. Uh, it's it's amazing. So before that, I I uh, write down basically my resentments. So when when I don't get what I want, I get resentful, like a kid. We're all like big kids actually running around, you know. And some more than others, you know. So when I drank. All my fears were anesthetized, and it felt great. That's why people drink, because it anesthetizes their fears. But if you, if you write down your fear, say, I have fear. Like before the morning, uh, before this interview, I had fear I'll be li- I won't be able to find the gym, Carl Grady's gym. And uh, <laughs> then I have fear, I'll cra- I always have fear I'll crash the car. I'll get on the plane, I always have fear, I fear the plane will crash. Because I have negative thinking. You know, it's kind of, the, kind of like, um, like the alcoholic way. You know, we always have negative thinking. But, and they're not real. Mm. But if you write them down, uh, they start to dissipate and they don't f- bother you as much. So I write them all down. But I write down the resentments first. When I don't get, I want to get resentful. He's always be resentful at my dad because the great guy, you know, he had eight kids. He had, he had a tough life. Uh, his father went to America when he was uh, very young and uh, was away. And, and when, the, when there was five kids and, and his mother passed away, had a heart attack in the kitchen, just like, like Dancing at Lunasa, that, that movie, kind of like the same thing. And they were left with her fa- mother or father for a long time, and, and his father came back and brought him to England and, and uh, as a young fellow. And, and, uh, so he had a rough life, you know. And uh, so uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot pass on what you haven't got. So, so he had, had a rough life. So his thing was boxing, you know, and... Uh, uh, so I'd be, I'd be resentful at my dad. So I'd be resentful at my dad because I fear he made me box. But the most important thing is to find out what the fears are, you know. Write them down. And then I'd write down, as I said before, the fears with no resentment atta- attached. Like I'd write down, I fear I'll run out of money. I fear I'll be late for the interview with Andy Lee. <laughs> it's all this stuff, you know. So you empty, empty your brain out. And you keep writing. And you think, and you, think you start doing it first, I'll never stop. But if you keep doing it, uh, uh, then, you think, then you say, just write them all down. And then I close my eyes and I meditate. And the feeling is as good as drinking when drinking was at its best. <laughs> and that, I'm not going to lie about that. Fascinating. <laughs> thank, thank, thank it is you fascinating. Thank you for sharing, yeah, for sharing yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Life after boxing. Life after boxing was hell. Yeah. There's actually a, a, a phenomenon, it's not a phenomenon to me anymore, in the medical books in America, and I, probably over here too, called PAS, Professional Athlete Syndrome. It's, it applies to Lee also like people who are, even if you have a job, you know, uh, when you retire. When you retire from boxing, I mean, I retired at 28. You know, most people retire in the 30s or so from boxing or from sports. When you use it, your whole, my whole life was boxing in the end. So when it was gone, it's like your best friend or your best and whatever you want to call it died. So how do you deal with that? That's why uh, a lot of fighters end up drinking, you know, uh, drugs, whatever they do, you know, a crime even, you know. That's a real obsession. Set the goal of feeling it right away. So um, I'm... Uh, um, I digress, as usual. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. How did you get into acting? This is a story. I uh, was drinking a bit in the... And uh, the next day, I had to go looking for the car, and I was over... Uh, the place where they keep the cars, they took them to, is over on the west side of Manhattan, near 34th Street. So I go over there, and I go in, and I get the car, and they, they says, oh, you owe a few tickets. I said, how many? They says, about $1,500. And that was 20 years ago, you know, more... And tw- twenty, probably twenty-five years ago. So I said, I don't have fifteen hundred dollars on me right now. So I walked out of the place and I walked to thirty-fourth and eleventh, and that's Hell's Kitchen in in New York, and, and uh, right near the stables. I used to drive the horse and carriages around the park, and our stables is right there. So I'm going to go walk by the stables, see who was over there, because I, I know there's people, I know, know some friends over there. 
And at, I'm standing on the corner, 34th and 11th, and um, waiting, waiting for the light to change. And this, I hear this Dublin accent goes, Seamus Mac. <laughs> I'm like, who is this fella? And it, I, I look over, and, and some fella sitting in a car, an old, an old car, and I say, hey. He, I said to him, I didn't even ask him anything. I said, are you going uptown? He says, yeah. I jumped in the car with him, total stranger. <laughs> and it turned out to be Jimmy Smallhorn, the actor from, you know, from Love, Hate, and, and um, uh, what's the movie that John Connors did? Uh, Cowboy Gangsters. Cardboard Gangsters, yes. Yeah. He said, I said, he says, I just got the lead in a play at the Irish Art Centre. And I, being the grandiose, you know, person I was, I says, have they finished auditions? He says, no. So I went down the next day and I auditioned for Nye Heron, who was the assistant director on My Left Foot and all those movies with Jim Sheridan. And I auditioned and Jim, and, and I gave him the part right away. And I started, I started loving acting. And uh, didn't do a whole lot of acting after that, but uh, uh, it kind of took off a few years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, when I got a, an email from a guy in New York, he's a, a writer for Newsday, uh, a sports writer, Bobby Cassidy Jr. And he says, he, this is the email said, he says, Seamus, hope you're well. He says, I wrote a play about my dad. My dad's supposed to play the lead. He can't do it, he's getting too old. Can you play the lead? We open in a month. I was like, okay, you know. To so the I, point. Yeah, I says, can you send me the play before I say yes? He sent me the play and I, I, I read it. The first time I read it, I cried, you know. And uh, I, we've done that about five or six times and, and uh, that's led to other things. And So, you so know. any plans to bring that to Ireland? We'd love to bring it to Ireland. You know, the big, the big, big problem is that we have about five world champions in, in, in the cast, mm. you know. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a great play. We'd love to bring it over here. Uh, we have a we have Michael Bent, former world heavyweight champion. Mm. Mark Breland's in it. Junior Jones is in it. Was in it, and he's not in it anymore. John Duddy's in it. And actually, uh, we were doing it a few years ago. And Jimmy Smallhorn, uh, I got him to be the director. And I was playing. I used to play, I played the lead, Kid Shamrock, the, fa the you know older and younger version, but great stuff in my hair to, for the older version. And we're doing it one time, and I said, I said, Jimmy, I said, when, I said, Jimmy, this, I think, and I said to Bobby Cassie, the writer, I says, it's too much work for me to do, you know, younger and older. I says, can we get someone else to do the younger? And they said, yeah. I said, who, who do you think we should get? I said, can I get you John Duddy? I'll ask John Duddy. They said, okay. So I called John, and John was uh, uh, about to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> and he leaves you another story here. <laughs> and uh, and he, he had decided not to have the fight. He just was he's finished with boxing. So I said, John, uh, we're doing this play. Uh, uh, there's a part I think you'd be great at. Would you be interested in doing it? He says, yes, right away. And he was down that day to start doing rehearsals. Mm -hmm. So John's been acting ever since. <laughs> and and th this is a funny story. I had to read this. After the fight, uh, my friend uh, Fred Skippy, Skip, uh, I went to school with, his dad, Fred Presapia, was in, uh, lived in Staten Island. So we went over there to see him after the fight. And uh, he says, Seamus, you're in Sports Illustrated. I said, great. Uh, I says, where? She so showed me, and there's a, uh, in Sports there's a picture of uh, uh, me laying down and Holyfield standing up. <laughs> and I said, just turn the picture around, and I'm standing up, and he's laying down. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty good. That was uh, Seamus McDonough in conversation with Andy Lee. It was produced and uh, shot by Joe Conroy. That's uh, my bad on. For God's sake, I've, Adrian. Um, turn my mic off. I've now turned it back on again so you can hear me. Sometimes was, uh, sound is important <laughs> for shows like this. In conversation with Andy Lee. You can check it out if you just caught the end of it or you want to rewatch it. Uh, share it with your mates. Subscribe to the channel because I will tell you when all of that good stuff is coming up. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash off the ball and it's a pretty bloody good watch. It was, because uh, you couldn't hear me the first time, it was uh, Seamus McDonough in conversation with Andy Lee and it was uh, shot and produced by Joe, uh, Joe Conroy. Um, so it was a, it was a, it was a pretty exceptional watch. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, that's really for this morning on. We've had to cull various aspects of the show because I'm blaming the producer. It was Tommy's fault. Always blame the producer. It's always the best thing to do.
Lots of good stuff coming uh, your way over the weekend. Uh, we have a very special off the ball broadcast from Porky Cueve. Tomorrow it's ahead of the Camogie quarterfinals. It'll be Clean Foley with a Saturday panel on the road. And as I said, it's in association with the Camogie Association. And we have some um, Cork legends there, two of whom might be on the Cork Mount Rushmore potentially. Irina Buckley and Sonia Sullivan and we're also going to be joined by the journalist Kieran McCarthy and Deputy Director of Sport at UCC uh, Christina Donovan um, and that all kicks off tomorrow afternoon you can get tickets for it if you head along to offtheball.com and particularly if you're heading along to the Camogie afterwards it makes for a pretty decent afternoon so that's coming your way tomorrow. Getting into Cork's Mount Rushmore is just a Pandora's box of uh, it is a little bit yeah. And really like you see I think what people forget is that Cork's Mount Rushmore would not just be four people because it's Cork. But that's the point of Mount Rushmore. Well, there is only four I know, people. but it's, what I'm saying is it's Cork's Mount Rushmore and it's Cork and... But the point of Mount you know, Rushmore is the people's is you pick Republic four people. of, Pork, of Cork do things their own way. It'd probably be about 10 people. It'd be but bigger, then it's not, then it's it'd not be Mount bigger and better and smarter and more beautiful than any other Mount Rushmore you've ever seen. But it, like, it'd be then, it's not, then, it's not, then it's not Mount Rushmore. It'd be a tremendous Mount Rushmore. <sighs> But it's, then it, you, you're missing the point of Mount, Mount Rushmore's four heads, top four. It's, your power, saying, it's not even it's power. Core. It's core. They do whatever then they want to do. It's not called Mount Rushmore, then it's called something else. No, it's called whatever the Irish can't for call it Mount it's Rushmore. Whatever the Irish for heads. Mount Rushmore is, that's what it is. It'd be tremendous. Beautiful. Most amazing Mount Rushmore you've ever seen. I don't know why I'm getting annoyed with this, but um, it's just such a failure of uh, understanding with Mount Rushmore. Speaking about getting annoyed about things, you're off to Killarney tomorrow afternoon to see Kildare and... Uh, Kerry, what, what represents a surprise in this game? I'll repeat the question that I asked Lee. This game, yeah. this game, well, Claire, Claire beating Kerry. Mm. Obviously. Like, I would suspect Kerry are going to look after their own business. I'll be, sitting in the, I'll be standing on the terrace in Killarney uh, watching Monaghan versus Galway. Let's just put it that way. I, that's what I expect to happen in the second half where hopefully Kerry will have a cushion where it's just listening to whatever is happening in Salt Hill. Mm. It's such, a, it's such a, a weird scenario to be in for championship yeah. where uh, y like your own game could be completely pointless in the end. Mm. Well, coming from Kerry, it's, I mean, from Westmead, it's mostly pretty pointless, so, um, you know, if you need any advice about how to deal with any of that stuff, just holler. Uh, please, yeah, no, like I'm hollering now. Resignation, at some point in the game, embrace it. Uh, don't get yourself, don't get too invested in it, because you're going to be disappointed. A bit late for that. Uh, like well over two decades of investment gone into this. Yeah, I know, yeah, I'm just saying, if you're looking for advice about how to deal with dis supporting disappointment, that's no, how to do it. I've had to deal with plenty, don't worry about that. Um, the Westmead Mead game a couple of years ago that uh, Westmead were eight or ten points down, whatever it was at half time. I at half time was like I had absolutely made my peace with the idea that this game was done. We we're probably gonna leave a bit earlier. Absolutely resigned to it. Never, that's, that's fine. I can't believe you were going to leave early. That's what happens. I I mean Yeah. Why like never leave early from any sporting event? You've got to see it through to the bitter end. No, I'd be with you. No, to be fair, I'd be with you. Even if it turns into a twenty-point hammering, you've got to be there till the very end. I, I was there until the end. I'm going to use this reference for the for the to the end of my days to back up that I endorse your point. I stayed until the end of the Denmark game. Yeah, a lot of people did. So, well, Bruce Shields was sitting behind me, and all I'm saying was he wasn't there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I did not know he was sitting behind you. <laughs> I mean, not a, you were, not, you were not, in, not, a, not a widely known fact. You were in the prawn cocktail or I prawn was not sandwich, in any uh, either prawn cocktails scenario. or prawn sandwiches. But you knew were in the, you were in a good seat. No, I wasn't. No, I was in Joe, Joe Punter's seat. Why did you do that? You were literally presenting a corporate I'm, event beforehand. I'm, I'm one of the men. No, I wasn't. I wasn't that night. No. All right, sorry. No. Uh, the Hurling Show is live and off the ball every uh, week. It's moved to a Thursday for the uh, final run-in, and so it was on yesterday. Uh, Jamie Wall was on this week's episode, and uh, here's how he sees the All-Ireland semi-final replay in Thurless going on Sunday. Yeah, we're the old sound. Look at it, it's Friday, lads. We're on a bit of a sort of doing a bit of a George Bush here on the wind into the weekend. Uh, so, right, it's golf. That's where we're headed next. And I'm assured we've got sound and pictures and all of that sort of good stuff uh, here. If you're a friend of the pod, uh, good for you because Golf Weekly is back. Uh, check it out if that's what you're into. Here's some Phil Mickelson goodness. Does Monty yeah, I, not deserve to be in the ah, yeah, he does Hall of Fame? He does deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. For his Ryder Cup career and for being European Order of Merit winner so Seven many years. times. Seven years. He's a Hall of Fame career. Okay. Just because he didn't win a major. Do you disagree? Can no. I leave now? <laughs> Just he because not? he didn't win does a major. You, like, your, oh, your whole, your whole, um, your whole career is based around when you get to that level um, about winning majors. 
So if you've never won a major, you know, should you be in the Hall of Fame? That's a very black and white way of looking at it, though. But that's what, that's what majors are. Does this Ryder Cup career not count for a lot? Ryder Cup's only a competition. It's a team competition. And does his European Order of Merit wins not uh, count for a huge amount? It counts massively in Europe, but it doesn't count massively in America. So you don't count him as one of the great golf players of the last 40 years? I consider him one of the, one of the best golfers in Europe for the last whatever many years. Mm. But he didn't bring that um, status to America and do, you know, he didn't dominate the American tour where all the best players played when he was playing. Like Monty travelled around to European tour events in a car and that's what he did. He went from event to event to event. He didn't play in the big events in America because he didn't like going to America because mm. he was ribbed so many times on Ryder Cups and stuff like that about his weight and about the way he played golf and and his uh, um, extramarital affairs and whatever it may have been. But I, and I said to somebody, we were talking about it at the Open there, um, about Monty being in the World Hall of Fame, and I, I, I basically would feel that the World Hall of Fame should have been around major winners and major winners only. That was uh, Peter Laurie in conversation with the lads on uh, Golf Weekly. Fairly interesting conversation, it has to be said, but I'm with Peter Laurie. I mean, nothing to do with the state of Nathan's shirt. I'm with Peter Laurie on this one. I think that... Uh, Monty had an excellent career. It's all couched, obviously, in a European context, in a US context, and you got to look at for when you're talking Hall of Fame, you got to look at it in the whole. It's it's nothing like he didn't win any majors. Like, did he have an excellent career? Well, he was like the lads say he obviously top European Order of Merit a number of years running and was a highly successful golfer. There is absolutely no doubting that because uh, apart from that, because there are so few that make it to that sort of a level, competed at majors. Could have won a few majors, didn't win any majors. Yeah, key point. I, I can't believe Joe and Nathan are actually trying to argue against Peter Laurie. It's that an one. individual sport where you, that's, what, that's how success is measured. Ultimately. Without question. So, some would say that you need to actually win multiple majors mm -hmm. to be considered in that. Rory McIlroy is at that level now, yeah. but uh, Paul Jacarton is at that level. Is Graham McDowell at that level? Probably not. He's won one major. Like, I mean, it's, that, that's, Should Gra that, that's a good question. Should Graham McDowell be a uh, Hall of Famer? Well, he's certainly got more of a shout than Colin Montgomery. It's good. No it's question good about it. Like that, I'm not even entertaining the idea that uh, Colin Montgomery deserves to be well, there more than Graham McDowell. I he's mean, a major winner. It's simple it, as that. That's an interesting question. Done. So, um, to extend the point, like McDowell had obviously, you know, more than one, but one very good week of his career where he uh, won the Open. Was the Open? Was the Open? No, the USPGA. USPGA. Um, so that puts him at a better standing than a guy who was probably I think you could say you could say that Montgomery was consistently better than McDowell. You that that's just that's actually that's just true. That's just a fact. Yeah, fair. But the height of the success. No, oh, but I'd agree with that. I'd, not, maybe neither of them are It, it depends famous. what the criteria is. Admittedly, I have not studied the criteria for what uh, it takes to be inducted. But but I don't think that, yeah. I think you should uh, make it up as you go along. I also admire the fact that every time you introduce a golf weekly uh, Clip, you're like, good news for friends of the pod, Golf Weekly is back. It tends to be back an awful lot. Yeah, golf every other week, that's the, that's the story with it. Uh, right, enjoy your trip to Killarney this weekend. Yeah, big jamboree coming. What's healthy. your plan? Uh, my plan is to catch up on some uh, much-required sleep. Oh, why, why, I'm not sure it's going to be a long story, I'll tell you off-air. One, uh, one OTB AM does not uh, a tired man make, no, so I'm interested no, to hear what no. the story is. All of that uh, coming your way, on for you only. Uh, in I'll make sure to live tweet our conversation. <laughs> Enjoy your weekend. Good morning. Good luck. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products.